right, we're gonna we're gonna get started here. Mr. Mays, are you ready for us to begin? <laughs> So this is uh, an informal meeting. We didn't know how many people we'd have, so we wanted to make sure that we had a, a big enough space. So, um, you know, as most public events, no one wants to sit in the front row, so I will stand as close to it as possible. So for those of you who don't know, uh, my name is Blake Pruitt. I'm superintendent of Ferndale Schools. What? <laughs> yes, just in case. Yes, I do, in case you don't know. Um, so tonight, we just want to kind of go over the work that has been done um, with the restructuring, where we're at, uh, talk about where we're going to be next year, uh, also be able to answer any questions uh, that you might have or any clarifications that we can make regarding where we are in the process. Uh, so we're going to start in, in a little bit of historical mode, if I can get this to work. There we go. So in 2012, there was a strategic plan process. Um, in 2013, it was board approved. There are three pillars of the strategic plan that guide the district currently, achievement, sustainability, and equity. And when we talk about these three, a school district is all about achievement. Now, what is that type of achievement? But we're all about students and about student achievement. And that can't be, um, that can't be done without sustainability and equity. So the board goals of strategic plan was 1415 to develop uh, elementary and secondary restructuring, and then 1617 looking at the implementation. So uh, that has been the timeline we've been working on. The mission of our strategic plan is Ferndale Public Schools' mission is to provide all students with exceptional education that prepares them for college careers and success in a diverse society. Uh, and I'll just you know give you a, a quick example. We had a, an interview of Channel 7 with two of our students today. And one of the things that they talked about was what an accepting place that Ferndale schools are and that how they feel that this is really their home, how they feel the care. And because of that, they feel very comfortable to learn and to take risk. Uh, so that helps our students move forward. That's a diverse society that we live in. So when we reviewed this year's implementation, next year's implementation, it's all about achievement, sustainability, and equity. So I'll, I'll keep on that goal. Our achievement, what's it defined as? All students can learn what they need if we have high expectations and they have the right support from us. We must help our students love learning and make them ready for college, careers, and lifelong education. When we say all students, we mean all students, from the student that struggles to the student that can you know, reach to the stars. You know, next year at the high school, we're looking at bringing in um, hopefully an, an adjunct professor to be able to teach some of our high-level math students. And that is probably my college son who doesn't know I'm doing this. There we go. Because he has to turn in his schedule tonight, and of course he didn't meet with his advisor till today. So since starting at Ferndale Schools, our overall goal is that we're one team. We all work together. Parents, teachers, students, community. This is all our work together. And that we're really about helping kids reach their dreams, their endless dreams. How do we do that? So in our buildings, we have four pillars to make our school improvement plans to make our schools better. We have high quality instruction. We have school culture. We have an intervention enrichment, assessment and results. As we look at Making our schools better, these are the four pillars that we work on. You know, if you don't have a good culture in your school, it's really hard to get high quality instruction. If you have a great culture, but you don't have high quality instruction, your kids don't achieve. If you don't have intervention for the students that struggle and enrichment for the students that can be pushed farther, everyone meets to the middle instead of really helping to push kids. You have to have some way of assessing that. Um, which just to fund aside, the, uh, the legislator yesterday and one of their committees decided to defund the M step for next year. So, um, you know, only God knows what the next assessment will be, the, you know, the M something. Uh, so just the joy of legislator, what we all deal with as educators. So what are we excited about with this restructuring? We have our new early childhood center. 
which I'll talk about a little bit later, and a massive increase in enrollment. Our middle school is doing Project Lead the Way STEM engineering curriculum, uh, which we're looking to hopefully move forward into the high school. That also, um, we've also included um, coding that's been done at the middle school as a class, as well as being done uh, in elementary in some areas. So we're really moving into the engineering and, and the STEM related fields. We've become um, the first Cambridge International School in the state of Michigan. We've started to have other districts come and tour us and see what we're doing. We have um, two people, and I know Jason Gillespie is, is very um, you know, upset that he has to spend his spring break in Cambridge, England. And I believe Lindsay Gonska also is, is spending her spring break in Cambridge um, on the dime of Cambridge International because they want to make this um, a stellar site for them to bring people to because we've already started a, a, a great startup with that program. We also had a group that on Cambridge Dine went down to Florida to be trained with other teachers that have been doing Cambridge for um, at least a decade. So that is something that's been a great program for middle school. Um, some of that curriculum will be brought down into elementary next year. Our Ferndale Secondary Honors Program that's been started up. We offer an advanced placement international diploma through Ferndale. We have 21 AP classes between the high school and CASA, which allows a student to get an international diploma if they so want. We've started our early college program, uh, which we have um, ourselves, the city, the police department will actually be going to Minnesota uh, in June to receive an award for that program. Uh, we're actually the largest startup of the early college program uh, in the state from last year. Students can earn their associates. I know you might have seen in the news yesterday, you know, if you graduate from a, a school in Detroit, you can get a, a free, t free two years of college. We're already ahead of that. Our students can do one extra year and earn an associate's in criminal justice, business administration, um, health sciences, or uh, computer programming. And they have an internship as part of it so they can go directly into the field or go directly into four year. So we have about 60 students in the district that are part of that program that already have, will have at the end of their junior year 16 college credits with um, adjunct professors who have been here. The students in the criminal justice program also work with our police liaison and with the police department. Um, I've already done training. I've already done ride-alongs. Um, our health science uh, folks are going to be working with the urgent care, working with uh, Jack Aronson at Garden Fresh Salsa, or formerly of Garden Fresh Salsa. He has a food incubator program called SEED, which we're looking at um, our business students uh, becoming part of that. And we're working with some people on our computer programming. We've revamped our alternative ed program. Uh, we've uh, become one with the Berkeley program, so we are now the Tri-County Educational Center. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, the, the impact of, of that program on the district from a financial end, but purely from an academic end. Uh, we have a higher graduation rate this year in that program so far than we've had in a long, long time. Uh, we have a stable enrollment. We have students passing more classes than we've had in the past. So we're seeing some better results with that program. I'm praying this isn't an emergency. No, OK. I was just making sure it wasn't my son for the second time. Um, Dad, bail me out. Uh, so we also started our new uh, Montessori program. It's been going excellent this year. And next year, we will have Spanish in our 3-5 building. And so we will be able to have Spanish from third grade all the way up to 12th grade. Our sustainability, funds for public education are limited and declining. We must make the best possible use of our financial and human resources and strive to keep enrollment at optimal levels while advocating for fair and adequate public funding. Sadly enough, we know the state has put a price tag on every student's head. And we have to live within those boundaries. So if 50 kids don't show up or 10 kids move, it has a severe impact on a school's budget. So to do everything that we need to do for student achievement, we need to be able to have the funds to do it. That means we need to be very judicious on how we use our funds. So this is from a group called Munectrix. They look at um, every district's funding in the state and give them a ranking. So we can see from 2011, about the same time that our enrollments uh, started to decline, especially in alternative ed, 
um, we've become more at risk. I will tell you, coming out of this year, that indicator will probably go back down to six, and our goal is to keep working back down. Um, so we should be as high as eight, and that's it. And we should never go above that. We should start coming back down. Um, what it means is that for a number of years, we weren't living in our, within our means. Um, we're back to living within our means this year, and our goal is to continue that moving forward. So and this does not include this year's enrollment. Um, this graph uh, is not available for this year's enrollment yet. But if you look at 2008, 2009, we started dipping a little bit in 2010. At the advent of the DLC program, where we went from 1,100 alternative ed students down to 300, that's where you see it go from a, just a 0.07 to a 27% drop in enrollment from, from 2008 to 2015 at the end of last year. That's when you think of 700 kids of a district of only about, you know, at that point about 3,500, that's significant. Now that wasn't a massive drop for Ferndale K-12. We dropped the same level just about everyone else did due to birth rate and due to the economy in 2009. But the fact the district had been surviving on 1,100 alternative ed students in three different programs, which I don't know if people knew we had three different programs. We had one out at the Northland Mall at a building called Crossroads. We had 550 students there. We had one at Taft, and then we also had one at Jefferson. And between all three, we had 1,100 students. Well, we had a retention rate of around 20%. We had a graduation rate of 7% in that program. Um, that's not educating kids, it's housing. So, but that's what shows where we lost, you know, our savings during that time was due to that severe enrollment drop that quickly. I will say this year is the first time since 2009 that we've actually had an uptick in enrollment. Um, we actually have more kids this year than we had the previous year. And our fall to spring count has been stable, which hasn't happened since 2008. So all the indicators are good for us moving forward. The state requires us to be at what's called a 5% fund equity, which is our savings. Uh, without that, we go into something called early warning. And sort of the great thing about the state, you go into financial early warning, that means you need to pay the state money to manage your books. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. Um, so we dip below, we will be back above 5% at the end of this year. So you have to be two years below, so we don't fall under that law at all. So we will, we will be fine in, in working our way back up. You should have somewhere between a 5 to 10% is, a, is really where you want to be as a school district to have that buffer. So something I just want to show that, um, that, our, that my staff has been able to do. We have two areas. We have instruction and then we have our, our supporting areas. If you look and see, in 2014, um, we spent 17.4 million on instruction. Uh, last year, we spent 16.8, so we had a reduction overall in instructional spending. Some of that was you know, reduction of staff and downsizing. Um, what we were able to do is this year, we're, we're actually up a million from last year in overall instructional spending. And if you look at our other areas outside of the classroom, we've decreased by two million. So we have truly put more money into the instruction side of the district while taking the money away from the non-instructional side. Um, that being said, I'm sure all the teachers, administrators can, can tell you there's not a whole lot of fat to cut in the district. Um, you know, you're, 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 you get to a certain point, you're not cutting fat, you're cutting marrow. So um, we've done, a, I think, a, a, a very good job at trying to get where we're putting more money into, um, into the classroom. And we're at about state and county averages now where we weren't before. Um, we were overspending on non-instructional areas before. So we look at our enrollment. We had a dip, and now we're, we're back up. Um, so I said we've stabilized enrollment and actually come back up on it. So in equity, social and individual differences must not determine achievement. Each and every student deserves equal access to support and resources necessary for learning. That is from our strategic plan. 
So what are some of the things that are guiding us on equity as we go through the, this work? Focused attention to the needs of the continuum of students, again, from the advanced to the at risk. As we look at the restructuring, as we look at our programs, how do we make sure that we've addressed all areas of education and not left one group out? Um, you know, as of right now, we are concluding a evaluation of our special education programming, um, comparing it to rubrics uh, statewide, countywide, uh, to see where we are and how we need to improve in that area. Uh, we, just, we haven't done that in a while, and it's a, a good time with the restructuring to do that. Equity of resources across building and across programs. Um, deliberate effort to close race and socioeconomic related achievement gaps. You will find this from our state superintendent. This is one of his 10 areas on his plan for the state. And the way he puts it is poverty matters. That socioeconomic gap is really an opportunity gap, which really causes the achievement gap. And it all goes back to poverty. And even though our economy is getting better, our, our poverty is growing as a country. So that's something as educators, we continue to work on. And just because a student's from poverty doesn't mean that they can't have their dream when they graduate in 12th grade. It's our job to try and help get them there. A sensitivity to different cultures and backgrounds, ensuring culture competency and awareness. And this is something that we've also been doing within our training, within the work we've been doing the last two years. So what happened this year, in case you didn't know? So we have a new early childhood center, um, the old Harding Administration Building. So since moving there, enrollment has increased by 20%. We've actually um, used every classroom in the building. We had to open another um, Little Eagles classroom in January for all the people that wanted to be part of it. Uh, we now have full day offerings, before and after school care. We have summer camps and play dates. Um, you know, we're, we're to the point that if we start getting more interest, we have to figure out how to find more space, um, you know, so we can make sure that we can service, you know, all our residents and all our people that want to be part of Ferndale. Uh, so this is this has been great. If if you ever have a bad day, walk into this building. It is it is very cool to walk around. Don't go into Heidi's office though. That's all I ask. Our grant building became our uh, TCEC program. We combined our adult and alt ed. Um, why is that important? And uh, I didn't put this up there, but and this gets a little convoluted. But our adult education, which we are the largest in the county for adult education, we're one of the only ones left, that's actually grant money that comes to us from the state. It's different than the money we get per pupil for K-12. That helps pay for some of the alternative ed. So that is money as we get those adult students. It helps offset things that we're already doing. And it's a great program that we're providing. We're one of the only ones that still has an adult ed, and they're growing because of the quality of the adult ed program. So we have the adult and the alt ed students together um, that are doing some of the same classes. We do offer classes all the way up to 7 PM. We have online classes. We have ESL classes. Um, so we service a lot, a lot of different adults um, and teens there. We've had stable enrollment for the first time since th 2009. We have about 350 students, and that's been stable. We should never have a district that has to rely on over 1,000 alternative ed students to, to make our budget. Um, so we've also had increased educational offerings. We're offering more classes, more wraparound services. Next year, we're looking at bringing in some CTE or some career pieces like EMT training, so those students could get EMT trained when they graduate and immediately go into the job field. There's a couple of other areas we're looking at for those students. And we have an increased graduation rate, which is even more important. The students are actually completing. So our central office has moved here to much of the chagrin of the high school administration. We've moved here to the third floor. And by doing that, we have about $200,000 of operational savings that can go back into classrooms. Um, by moving us up here. Our Jefferson building, um, which needed about three to four million dollars of work to really bring it up to compliance, we couldn't put K-12 students in there. It would have been illegal. Um, why it was okay to put d adults in there and we wouldn't let kids was beyond me. Um, but that's already been sold for 550,000. That goes directly back to the district, back to putting in to repair buildings. Um, and there'll be 60 unit housing development that's going in. As a mayor of Oak Park has said, 
Um, it's the first investment south of nine for housing since the 50s. And it's 15 million investment on that property um, that's going in there. So then we get to 1617. We, that's just a couple little things we did in 1516. So the sixth grade moves to the middle school. So why did, why did we do this just to rehash? Um, achievement, sustainability, equity. In terms of achievement, the sixth graders get to have a hybrid between the elementary, secondary type of schedule, taking the best of both worlds. That was worked on by teachers, administrators, parents, um, took all the input work together to make a unique model for our sixth graders. It's really a good mesh between the two. Uh, they get access to the Cambridge International Program, and they get access to Spanish. As well, if you think about the fact they get access to this entire building and all the different pieces that they get to have here that you don't have in a smaller elementary building. Sustainability, it allows the closure of elementary buildings, about $400,000 of operational savings a year. 400000 we don't have to spend on non-instructional areas. In equity, we get to offer the same, all the offerings for sixth grade. From an instructional standpoint, it also helps those sixth grade teachers be with the other teachers all the way up to 12th grade so that you can make a nice continuum. You always want to reverse engineer. If we want the student to graduate here, what do we need to do you know, all the way backwards? Our Ferndale Elementary, our upper and our lower campus at Roosevelt and then JFK. Achievement, it's our ability to use all the best practices consistently. And this is something that in all educational literature you will see. If you want the best for all kids, you have to use the best practices. You don't want a doctor that they trained in the 70s or the 80s and have never kept up with best practices. You, know, you want an educator that does the same thing. And our educators do a lot of professional development and a lot of work to make sure that we are keeping up to date and doing what's best for kids. Combination of all historical best practices in Ferndale. So taking what we have done in the district and taking the best pieces of it, our project-based learning, our, our outdoor education, you know, and go through the whole list of things that we have done historically that have been good, making sure that we're keeping those updated in best practices and combining all those to make the best possible education for kids. We have grade level teams. Um, in, in something in, in the literature you'll find, this sort of um, work is called the Princeton model. It's something that Princeton had, uh, had done education, had done research on in talking about how the grade level teams equals to the best level of achievement. Um, the focus studies that the group is working on, project-based learning, outdoor education for every student. Again, for 3-5, the addition of, of bringing Spanish back. Sustainability, it allows us to balance class sizes better. Um, when you have you know, grades in different, in different buildings and all of a sudden you have two extra kids in this building or five extra in this building, you can't necessarily sh you know, move kids around the buildings to make you know, the, the proper class sizes and make sure you have the right mix of students. And for equity, it's the same offerings and access for all K-5 students. UHS moves to Coolidge, as we affectionately call it, UHS 2.0. Our achievement, Coolidge is really a secondary instructional space. Uh, if you've been to UHS building, the Wilson building is an elementary building. Um, there's some kids there that are sitting in desks that elementary kids sat in a couple decades ago. Um, they don't have a space to have all their kids together. The gym can't hold everybody. Uh, so for them to really get a good high school experience, they need to be in a building that can fit them appropriately and give them the education. And that being said, even with the limitations of, of the current UHS building, that administration and those staff have done phenomenal things with those students. 100% college admissions, graduation, um, a very high percentage going on past the first year of college. Those, those students are very successful. With that space, they have the ability to do some more offerings, to do some more things instructionally. Um, they're doing the sports at Coolidge right now anyway because they can't do the basketball in their own gym. Um, so it actually allows them to do the sports on site instead of having the kids off site. Um, honestly, for recruitment, we recruit a lot for that building because all those students are coming new to us in ninth grade. Uh, it's a more attractive building. It's a better space to be educated in. Uh, it's better for recruitment and, and retention. Uh, and Wilson can then be the sold and sold and developed in the housing with the board is working on that process at the moment. Equity, again, we'll finally have a gym and a cafeteria. It's the little things in life that make a difference. 
uh, and the school is really designed for students more their age than, than the Wilson building. So during this process last year, we got some stakeholder input. These are some of the areas that we've still been paying attention to to make sure that um, we're keeping fidelity of what we promise the community. The diversity, the project-based learning, world language, service learning, making sure that we're trying to keep all our excellent teachers. Um, and again, that goes towards you know, putting more money into instruction and trying to make sure we have the proper supports for students, for teachers, so that our kids can be successful. What are some of the things that our teachers had said last year for a high quality school? Diversity was the number one thing they said. They wanted sustainability and stability. There's nothing worse as an employee to not have stability in your job and to always be worried. That doesn't always make for a really good classroom setting. So the more stability and sustainability you can have in a, in a district, the better it is for the teachers, better it is for the staff, better it is for the kids. Strong leadership making sure that we have the right leaders in the right place. Updated materials and resource, again, goes back putting money into the classroom. You know, you hate making the decision of do I get a new textbook? If I get a new textbook, I have to lay off a teacher. That's a horrible situation to be in. Um, and we do know we still have some materials that we need to work on updating. Um, you never want to grab that book and says, and someday man may land on the moon. Parental involvement, again, the community aspect of Ferndale that's so important that our parents are actively involved in a student's education. They're actively involved in the building through the PAC, through the PTA, um, you know, and, and that we can try and continue that all the way K through 12, um, making sure that our parents are an active part of our school education team. One-to-one -one technology. We are continuing to get more and more technology. If you uh, notice, we have actually have open Wi-Fi now, so all of you can check your email instead of listening to me or check Facebook or Twitter, whichever you prefer. Um, it's the first time that we've had open access across the district. We're getting more Chromebooks, iPads. Uh, we have someone that's working on tech integration uh, that's working with the teachers and working with the students. Uh, so we're moving ourselves forward very quickly. And then one of the things teachers have said, you know, they want to have class sizes that they can work with the students. And again, that goes to a budget issue of trying to make sure we have enough money to do that. So moving forward, I'm going to hand over the microphone to uh, Ms. Rushlow to go through uh, what her group has been working on with our Ferndale Elementary School. Hi, everyone. How are you? Do you need to stand up and stretch? No? You're good? Take a deep breath. Relax. All right, so this year with the restructuring of the elementary and our students moving to the middle school, we have provided professional development, um, time dedicated in our early release Mondays, which we call our professional learning communities, and our staff meetings. Our intent for this is to provide clarity on our elementary restructuring that focuses on our instructional processes and practices. We want to make sure we are gathering valuable input for outcomes that matter to all of us. And we want to provide dedicated time for our staff to work together towards a strong transition and a purposeful elementary community. When we think about purposeful community, one with collective efficacy and capability to develop and use assets to accomplish goals that matter to all the community members through agreed upon processes. Am I echoing or no, just here? You're good? So as we've been meeting with the staff, they're probably tired of hearing this term collective efficacy, but it's very important that we all understand the power behind it. It's defined as a shared belief that by working together, we all make a difference. The belief is that through a united effort, we can make a difference in the schools where we work. And blending these three elementary schools into two, we really have to be dedicated and focused to have that collective efficacy. So my team along with the administrators and the instructional lead teachers, we've really had a focused design to make sure we get information, we bring it to the staff, we get their input, we bring it back, and, we keep, and it's been a cycle all year long, including an instructional transition team. If you can raise your hand if you've been part of our elementary instructional t transition team, which we just met for another hour right before this, you can raise your hand li how, like proud. 
be proud of that. These people have worked with me and um, every two, every other week um, for two hours, one to two hours every other week throughout the whole year, making sure that we're fluid in what we're doing. So thank you for that. Our elementary transition committee and curriculum and instruction have, were charged with developing a common vision, a template for the daily weekly schedule, a three-year professional development plan, how we will design the components of Cambridge into our existing curriculum, um, developing project-based learning expectations and practices by grade level. And although all of us have been doing PBL, we've all do done that in different ways with a different philosophy within our own schools. Developing focus studies and implementations, deciding on world language components, a little bit more. Developing a con common understanding of the school culture, de designing a systematic social and emotional learning plan to be implemented, implemented K-5, design standards-based report cards that are much easier to use as a parent, as a student, and as a teacher. Homework guidelines for K-5. We just finished that up um, just a few moments ago. Um, understanding the special ed students' needs so that they have less fragmentation and more inclusion. That's very, very important that we move through that model to make sure that we're doing that and that all of our children understand that they are accepted and understood and that we meet their needs. And determining um, what technology looks like. What will that look like at K2 next year? What will we have at 3-5? And how will that support our children's needs? The first thing that we did was to come up with a collective vision for our lower campus and our upper campus. That collective vision was provided to everyone that was at our first town hall. We brought back input. It was provided at our first professional development. We brought back that input. S these are some of the key words. At both campuses, we have a collective vision. The first part of it is all about the child. The second part is all about the parents. The third part is all about the teachers and it's culminated by what we're going to do as a school family at our K2 campus and our 3-5 campus. So we have looked over this more and more, and that has been leading our progress from everything else that we're doing. So these are some of the key words that we have seen and implemented into those visions. One of the first things that we did was come up with common definitions for our Ferndale Elementary School. For us to do this, and I'll show you on, um, I have a link in a moment, if Bill help me, helps me find where it is there. I would like to show it. We want to have clarity, commonality, and when we do that, that our teachers all are using the same language, our students, our families, then we have more coherence, and going back to that word of collective efficacy, which is so powerful within our community. So all of this stuff, all the documents that we've done will be on our Ferndale Forward website, but also on our website. But as you can see, as we go through this, at our, lupper, our lower and upper campus, we have common language so that everyone has an understanding of what's happening. When we talk about arts education, what do we mean? When we talk about alignment, what's Atlas Rubicon? And we go through all of these. And so families can look this up. 
and teachers. The teachers will have this um, as a hard copy as well so that we understand what we're talking about so that we can support our children in a much better fashion. So that goes from A to Z. What is interactive notebooks? What do we talk about when we talk about intervention? What are learning outcomes? Things like that, so that we all have that common definition. So the first things um, that I want to talk or share with you about curriculum is that this year we have gone to our achievement committee and to our board and asked for updates on math, science, social emotional plan, media 2.0, and Spanish. We've done a lot of work um, and we will continue to wish our teachers well with the amount of changes that will take place in the classroom. So, I mean, kudos to them for wanting to do all of this. When we think about math, we've used everyday math for many, many years, and it was time for it to go. So we are very thrilled that we have found a product called Envision 2.0. Um, we are the first group in Oakland County to adopt it, um, and I know that I can say on behalf of all of the teachers, we're ecstatic about this program. Yesterday, Pearson came into um, do some professional development, and we had about 20-something teachers there um, learning the product, going online, finding all the tools that we have, and you could just feel the excitement in the room over math. Now, I sorry, Tom, but you know how I feel about that. Um, but just wonderful information that we'll be able to have, parents will be able to have. It's very, it's a useful product and I know that the, not only our teachers, but our students will benefit as well. In regards to science, our current science kits are more than 10 years old. Um, and that's, we really needed to update that. Our focus is to have hands-on project-based learning. And at this time, we're sharing kits. Grade levels can't use the same unit simultaneously. Well, for next year, we adopted um, more kits that are aligned and we will be using Battle Creek and then we'll be using the components of a Cambridge learner which also goes hand in hand with that whole hands-on engaging project-based learning so we're very thrilled that we'll be doing that social emotional plan part of our strategic plan asks that we look into this these are um, social emotional learning impacts academic learning just like we teach our students reading and writing, we have got to teach our students what it is to be a great citizen, what it means to have character, what it means to have value. What we have done, um, all of our social workers, our school psychologist, Heather Urbanowitz, who received her master's degree, and anyone here would consider her a guru, guru for social emotional development, um, have come together, and they have put together six modules that are six weeks long. In those modules, they have useful information that every teacher, K-5, will use every day. Every day during morning meeting, they will have a focus and we will have that conversation. And then the teachers have permission to embed this into their daily learning activities. And I think that's a key. We all do this all the time, but now we'll be consistent, we'll be systematic, and we will teach the children skills that are necessary to make be successful not only during the school day, but at the end of the day as well. Our first module is called Creating a School Family. Our children will learn what composure is, how it means to use a big voice, how to be assertive. The best thing to deal with a child that's being hurtful is to be assertive and giving them those skills to use that. So on Friday, we will be meeting with our elementary teachers and going over the first module, which is Creating a School Family. Amy Turant, is, is she here? No, but her husband is. Um, will be working with our committee and has already started talking to us and she is helping us create the second module which is teaching mindfulness. 
Our third module is growth and positive mindset. Our fourth module is um, teaching brain states. When our children understand where their brain is and how it's functioning at this given time, they'll be able to have a better variety of tools to choose from. For example, if you're in your brain stem, all you know how to do is fight or flight. Has anyone ever been in their brain stem? When you're in your limbic system, women, our limbic system is much bigger than men's. <clears throat> but that's because that's why we like to talk more, <laughs> which I don't know about that anymore. <laughs> But we have more emotions and things like that. When children are being mouthy or they are uncontrollable, those are things that happen in our limbic system. And we have a limited amount of tools to use. But when we teach children how to move into their brain, uh, into their frontal lobe and to use that, then they know how to have problem solving, be creative, which is what we want our children to do. So we have to teach them the skills to get there and how to get back when they're upset. Our other modules are um, executive functioning, being conscious about what you're doing. Ch children understand this so much. And I'm, I'm missing a few modules, but you get the hint. It's beautiful. Oakland schools calls, and they keep coming to our meetings. I feel like we're, they want this stuff. Um, and MDE as well. MDE is so interested that they gave us um, a sample of their draft. So starting in 1617, the MDE has social and emotional standards, pre-K through 12, that people need to design and follow. But we're so far ahead of the game. So I'm very excited about that. They've done beautiful work. Media 2.0. Right now, our children go to the media center. They hear a teacher read aloud book, and they check out a book. Starting next year, what we will do is redesign that. We're really hoping that we get a lot of parent involvement and parent input into this. But our children will learn 21st century skills, keyboarding, acceptable use and guidelines on, uh, on using technology, what it is about Google, all of those things that make a difference. And in addition, they'll have opportunities for more makerspace activities. Again, aligning to our project-based approach, letting children be doers and learners. And the last part is Spanish. Having Spanish in grades three through five, they will receive Spanish within their classroom two times a week for 40, 40 minutes a time. I think so. So um, starting in grades three through five. In addition, those things, oh my, sorry about that. It's messed up a little bit. These things that we have asked for, project-based learning, Focus studies, which is a, pro, um, a focus study is something that children are interested in learning, let's say chess or dinosaurs. That group of students, grades three through five, will come together um, for about two weeks for a certain amount of time during the day and just learn more information about that. So we're going to start that. We have teachers, um, Roberta Lusk has been doing some piloting for that this year. Is there, I can't think of the, is there another teacher? Michelle Harris has also been piloting that for us this year as well. So we're going to look at that at grades three through five. Homework guidelines. Homework guidelines, it's a delicate issue. There's lots of research on both sides of the field. So what we have done is design a pro, um, guidelines that will be helpful. And we have um, just finished the draft, and we will be bringing that to the Achievement Committee and to the board, uh, just to the Achievement Committee to look over those guidelines for homework. So what does practice homework mean? What does, um, I can't think of it, extensions mean? And what does engagement mean? And so we have three different categories for our homework now. So there's a purpose and a mindset behind it. But our mindset about the homework guidelines is that there's no tiers. It's not punitive, but we're instilling values in our children that understand and become responsible. And that's all it is. We don't want them sitting there crying. We don't want them there for hours. What we want them to do is understand that those routines instill the value of importance and become self-directed learners. Intervention and enrichment. Every building will have dedicated time. During that time, we will focus on where the child is and move him or her forward. So if they need intervention support, they will receive it. However, if they don't, they will receive some enrichment and it will be based on by grade level. 
self-directed learners I already spoke to you about, but um, Sue Adamson, who's in the room, and Amy Siglerick helped us come up, come up with um, definitions by grade level. What does that mean? I've been here for many, many years, and I always hear that term that we use, but we never had a clear definition of what it meant to be self-directed learner at the age of five. What does it mean by the age of nine? So we now have those guidelines that will help us move forward. And standards-based report cards. Um, one night at our in instructional transition committee, we just started talking about the, wor the worthiness of our current report card. What do parents walk away with? I know what teachers walk away with. Elementary has to input everything. I mean, it's just, it's not friendly for the teacher. We never thought about the child and what we were giving to them and to the parent. So our new report card is designed, one, to celebrate where your child is at and to have that conversation of all that good work and to show you what standards they're working on, where they were at the first quarter compared to the second qu quarter compared to the third. And on the final um, part is just hints for home. So it's easy to read for your child, for your child to have the conversation with you and for you to have that conversation with your child and to ease what the teachers do. And the last thing is camps. We have worked with all three um, staffs on what they have done in the past for camps and how we can have input into how we move forward. And so all three schools have done a little bit something different. So for the 16, 17 year at K2, it is, um, cannot think of the theme. Adventure? No, it'll come to me. Anyway, we are working on the K2 met with me yesterday. Exploration is K2 and adventure is 3-5. Then each grade level has thought about different ways that they could make those camp experience meaningful to them. Go to, um, for example, at second grade, go out to camp and then the second day be center-based right within the school building and things like that to make it more um, acceptable and then we will once we have that input hand it over to our camp coordinators to help design all of that I'm going to turn the mic over to um, Mr. Gillespie to talk about the sixth grade transition Great. thank you uh, my name is Jason Gillespie I'm the principal of the middle school and uh, one of the, the, the big adjustments that we needed to make um, was bringing the sixth graders into the middle school and really looking at that instructional model that we wanted to use with those sixth graders. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on the process that we used, uh, we had uh, a focus group of teachers. We had two teachers from JFK, uh, two sixth grade teachers from Coolidge, and then uh, two middle school teachers. We had a counselor. Uh, and uh, a performing arts teacher, band teacher, Tim Burke. So we tried to kind of have a sampling of the entire district. Um, and basically what we wanted to do was just look at and throw every idea that, 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 that we had as far as an instructional model, um, all the way from a completely self-contained class where you have one teacher and 25 students and you teach them all the subjects, to more of a secondary model where you have six different teachers and six different subjects. We kind of did a pros and cons of all that. And then I went and I visited all the local middle schools around us who have uh, sixth graders at their middle school. Went to both Berkeley Middle Schools, uh, Royal Oak Middle School, uh, Hazel Park Junior High. Uh, talked to those principals about how they deliver instruction. And then finally we had a, a, a parent focus group as well and we met uh, two or three times here in the late fall and early winter and basically went through the same process with, with that group as well and I see some of you are here. Um, and basically what we settled on is this, is what you see behind me, which is what we kind of refer to as a blended model. Um, and th the reason we did is because one of the concerns that we heard from the parent group is, um, and, and we see this also with our seventh graders, is having six different teachers, six different classes presents some organizational challenges um, to students that are so young, um, particularly with all the other changes that are going on in the district. So we wanted to provide them that consistency uh, of the model that they have currently, where, where you have basically two teachers 
that teach them their four core subjects. So you have uh, an ELA and a social studies teacher, and then a math and science teacher. Um, and and uh, so you have that, that communication and that consistency with, within that, that team approach. Um, but then what we also want to do is expose the sixth graders to the benefits of, of a middle school education, which are the electives. Um, so what you see there is the, um, the, the, the six over on the left-hand side are, the, are the, the, the teams. And then you see the, the blocks, so to speak. And then we have that elective block uh, under hour three. Um, and at that point, those students will go on an elective rotation. So you're not getting, like now you get you know, a half hour of art once a week, a half hour of music. Here, you're getting a, a kind of a taste of what the uh, middle school electives have to offer. You have uh, an AB rotation or an even odd rotation, if you want to think of it like that. So on A days, the sixth graders will have band, orchestra, or vocal music, depending upon their, uh, their choice. And then on B days, they're going to get a semester of PE, a quarter of art, and a quarter of Spanish. So they kind of get a taste of the elective offerings that we offer. And then on, on the flip side, a benefit to the sixth grade staff is that is their common planning time, which I can assure you that all the other teachers in this district are jealous of. Um, that, that the sixth grade teachers have that so they can really get together and focus on both curriculum and, and the students as well. So that, that, that's a huge benefit there. Um, then we have our lunch. And then again, going back to the, the pillars that, uh, that, that Dina and Blake talked about in our school improvement plan, built-in intervention and enrichment time. And what's nice there is not only can we use the current sixth grade staff, but also the other middle school staff and even high school staff to help support um, those students who need that extra boost with the intervention as well as uh, provide a challenge for those that need that enrichment. And you can see over on the, um, on the bottom where we have some enrichment ideas which uh, Ms. Rashidu already discussed with you know, PBL, STEM with our computer coding class and Project Lead the Way, we're looking at offering some modules there. Um, focus studies and, and choir as well. Um, you also see some ideas that we have as far as how we can integrate Cambridge. I know that uh, Mr. Pruitt, one of his big priorities was having a true honors math class uh, in the sixth grade. So that uh, right now what we have is our seventh grade teacher, uh, the, the honors math, she has to cram in two years of math curriculum in one year. And that's challenging. She teaches both the seventh and eighth grade in one year. So now what we're able to do is we're able to have a year and a half of curriculum in the sixth grade and then a year and a half of curriculum in the seventh grade, uh, more appropriate um, use of that time. And then that sets them up for algebra or geometry in the eighth grade. So it really kind of frees that up. So um, yeah, that, that's it, what we're doing with uh, sixth grade. Um, and as far as, uh, we're, you know, we're still looking at, uh, we have some athletic considerations to consider. Uh, we're, um, the, the problem with, with sports for sixth graders is we just don't have a lot of teams for them to play against. Right now, sixth graders will be able to participate in swimming, track and field, and we're looking at possibly a cross-country team and maybe a girls basketball team. We're working on that right now. We're also going to be continuing the sixth grade camp tradition. Uh, we're going to uh, the Howell Nature Center and Reserve for three days and two nights in November. Um, so we have that on the books. And uh, yeah, that's it. So if you have any questions, I'll, I'll be available after the meeting. Thanks. So just to wrap up what we've been working on, There's a few next steps for students. I know Mr. Gillespie was at, were you with fifth or sixth grade today? Sixth grade. And then um, in May, we will be bringing fifth and sixth graders over for a part of a day, and they have all sorts of great activities planned to get them adjusted to the Ferndale Middle School culture. What's next steps for us? 
um, as, an as an elementary staff, our professional development. Right now, we have new leadership teams that are working on the school improvement plan. It's a very long process. Um, we met with K2 on Tuesday, um, last week as well for two hours after school, 3-5 tomorrow, and we met with them um, a few times after school as well last week. Last night we had Envision, our first professional development on Envision, and we'll continue to do that. Friday we're rolling out our social emotional plan. And then um, we surveyed the teachers to see if they were interested in coming back to three to five days before school began for professional development. And this is what's dedicated about Ferndale. 100% of them said yes. 100% of them said yes. I don't know. I got the goosebumps about that. So we are planning that as well. That'll give them time to work with their new staff, learn some um, and dialogue with each other, and then be able to have some personal development time setting up their classrooms. The moves will be significant over the summer. Building leaders, they have been visiting elementary schools. Um, we've had mentors assigned and they've been coming in to work with them. Um, they're working with their leadership team. Um, and they are working in partnership with the PTA, PAC, and OPEN at this time. Our summer plans, I have some flyers for you. We have some summer play dates for our preschool. We have a summer camp um, for our preschool students as well. It's Fern and Dale's Funshine Camp. So if you're ever bored one day, please come over and see Fern and Dale at Heidi's building. So thank you, Heidi, for organizing that. Um, we have been working in partnership with Ferndale Recreation this year with our half day and um, lo week long camps with school age childcare and we will be partnering with them all summer so our children at the elementary level will have some camps that they can attend that are in partnership with myself and um, Mr. Johnson. Um, during the summer, we will have some updates with buildings. We feel it's very important that when we walk into the Ferndale Elementary Lower Campus or the Ferndale Elementary Upper Campus, that it's new, that we start our school year in August and September as a new building. So you'll be seeing some surprises happen over the summer. And um, both um, Ms. Jeffries and Mrs. Keefe will be doing some educational clips and be sending them out via text and email over the summer, um, showing you different parts of their schools. Um, although you will be very interested in them, they are for your children. So if you see them dancing or doing something crazy, let me know. And that is all of I, all I have. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. Thank you for that brief uh, technical pause. Uh, my name is Tom Shelton. I am Assistant Superintendent for uh, Human Resources and Facilities and a couple other odds and ends around the district. Um, my charge in this process has been to manage the logistics side of the things that we have to deal with um, over the next summer. Um, over, over the next year, really. Um, and so I have a logistics committee. I see many friendly faces out in the audience who've been working with me over the course of the last, over the last year or so. Um, and it's been an interesting evolution for this group as we started talking about several issues. Uh, most recently, we have become kind of uh, uh, bogged down in the nitty gritty of the moves this summer, the physical moves, which we realize are going to be uh, quite daunting. So. Um, I have about five or six kind of broad topics that I want to provide everybody just a brief update on. Um, and uh, the first topic is busing. So I want to say a few things about this. This is a topic that we had a lot of discussion about in our group. Um, we have not yet established building start times for the 16-17 school year. Um, there are several moving parts to that discussion um, in different buildings, and um, we have not established firm times for that yet. Uh, we anticipate sometime in April we're going to be making announcements about start and end times for the different buildings. Uh, things that we do know for sure, uh, we do know for sure that the lower campus and the upper campus will have a staggered start and end time between the two of them, sometimes somewhere around 15 or 20 minutes, so that families and buses can logistically manage drop-offs and pick-offs and uh, drop-offs and pick-ups in, <laughs> in both buildings, excuse me. Drop-offs and pickups in both buildings. We think that given the given the uh, the uh, physical locations of those two buildings, 15 to 20 minute uh, stagger time should be enough uh, to accommodate that for everybody. Uh, we also know that in terms of busing, we will have common busing between those buildings, and I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by that. Buses will go out into the neighborhoods and they will pick up at the same bus stop at the same time both students for the lower campus and the upper campus. So if a family in, uh, in a neighborhood down on this side of town has a first grader at the lower campus and a fifth grader at the upper campus, those students will get on the bus together in the neighborhood. They will ride for first to, say, the lower campus where they'll drop off the lower student. The bus will then continue on to the current Kennedy building where they drop off the older student. The afternoon, the process will reverse, and those same students will ride home together. Um, so that was something that we heard pretty loud and clear from our from our parent community that they would like to see. Our community, our, our committee was very uh, adamant that they thought that was important too. So again, those younger and older students will be riding the buses together next year. Um, in terms of movement between buildings, this is where uh, we are currently and where we currently will be spending, where we will be spending a lot of time between now and the summer. Um, if you think about, it, most of us as adults have had the experience of moving from one house to the other, and you realize as much as you can prepare for that and as much as you can get ready for that, when you get down in the nitty gritty of I've got all the things that you need to think of, yeah, a million different things come up. And I, moving buildings is, is no different. You know, as prepared as we can be and as on top of things as we can be, there are undoubtedly going to be a million tiny details that we haven't thought about that we're going to uncover as we go. Um, but we're looking at moving s approximately 75 staff members between four buildings this summer. Um, and when you think about that and you think about everything and with a lot of them being elementary teachers too, no offense to elementary teachers, but um, I don't expect that any of you are going to be packing particularly light. Um, <laughs> um, it's go it's going to be a big process. It's going to be a big process. And I can't underestimate the amount of time and effort that first of all those teachers are going to have to spend in organizing those classrooms and packing their materials, but then the physical effort of moving those to new classrooms is pretty, uh, pretty daunting. Um, if you think about it, we have internal moves. We have teachers at Roosevelt. I, 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 we have teachers at the lower campus and at the upper campus who are going to be moving from one side of the building to the other, to a new classroom, so that we can keep grade levels together. Uh, we have our teachers from Coolidge who are going to be moving, most of them are moving either to the upper campus or to the middle school here. 
Um, and then we have the entire University High School building, which is moving from the Wilson campus to the current Coolidge campus. So all of those are huge moves, and all those are going to take a lot of coordination and a lot of time. Uh, just recently, and I haven't even been able to share this with my, evalu with my uh, committee yet, uh, we did accept a bid, from, a bid from the Corrigan Moving Company. So we will have a moving company that will be uh, moving and handling our physical moves this summer. Um, they have been, uh, they've done work with the district for many, many years. They managed the last move for us, the last big move like this. They managed our move last summer when the Grant Building moved to Harding and we moved up here. Um, so we've worked with them a ton and we have a lot of confidence in them that they're going to do a good job with us. Um, the target date for that move is the last week of June. Um, and it will be kind of staged out. So the move, the biggest move, which is the move of UHS from the Wilson building to the Coolidge building, that will be the last move. First, obviously, you have to make room for the Coolidge teachers to move out of Coolidge. Then you can move the Wilson teachers over, the UHS teachers over. So um, they, uh, last week in June is our target date for that. Uh, we're very, uh, I feel really good about the process that we went through in terms of tentative placements for the staff. Um, by February 1st, all of our K-5 teachers got notification of where we anticipated placing them next year. Um, almost to a person, almost everybody got their first choice in terms of their grade level and building assignment. Um, and so we're really happy that we were, for the most part, able to honor teacher requests in terms of where they would like to be next year. So that's real positive for us. So at this point, everybody has a very good idea where they're going to be next year. Um, we'll, we're working on classroom assignments and those other things. Um, but in terms of the moving process, getting back to that, our ultimate goal is that all of the buildings will be in their new locations and the offices will be set to open up after the 4th of July holiday. That's what we're working towards. We also have a lot of construction going on this summer, so I just want to share briefly the different things that are going on in our buildings, particularly those buildings affected by the move. Uh, in Coolidge, uh, as you know, Coolidge was originally built as a junior high school, and uh, when it became an elementary school, there was uh, some science lab that was converted into classroom space. We're now converting it back to a science room for secondary. Um, obviously, those secondary students, those UHS students, need that lab space for science classes, and so that's a project we're undertaking in the Coolidge building. Um, Roosevelt, we've been uh, getting through this winter with uh, duct, duct tape and bubble gum and prayers all over the place, and it looks like we made it through. It looks like we made it through the winter, crowd knock somewhere, um, with the boilers, and we do have a complete boiler replacement scheduled at Roosevelt this summer. Um, so that's going to put a little bit of a wrinkle in our logistics, but we're excited about the ability to. Uh, um, to have that. Uh, we also at the uh, Board of Education meeting this week, our board approved a new uh, playground construction at Roosevelt, um, which is really exciting um, and uh, um, really neat to see. So that'll be happening at Roosevelt as well. At Kennedy, we have a little bit more construction going on at Kennedy, uh, the, the upper campus. Uh, first of all, the locker room space um, towards the, uh, across the hall from the gym. Um, those spaces are being completely refigured into um, AI and CI classrooms. Those are special education classrooms. Um, so the uh, designs for those rooms are, are really impressive. We um, are very excited to be able to offer a really updated, fresh, and, and nice space for those students that they deserve. Um, in con with that construction happening, with the uh, we're also going to be converting some current special education classrooms into ge into general education classrooms. Uh, there's some office space in that building that we're converting into some classroom space, again, to make room for the capacity there. Uh, we're also very excited that um, it looks like we may be b bringing new playground equipment over that the City of Oak Park is donating to us. So uh, we're working on, some, uh, working on some plans for that, but it'll be real exciting for those kids at the upper campus uh, to have some fun and exciting, nice playground equipment on the playground there at the upper campus. So, in, in addition, and Ms. Rochelle mentioned this briefly in her presentation, we're really ex we're, we're talking a lot about what other small cosmetic logo kind of improvements can we make in each building uh, to support the idea that these are brand these are new buildings, these are new exciting places. We want to get everybody fired up about these new schools, these new programs, and uh, so we hope to have a lot of those minor cosmetic kind of 
projects uh, completed through the course of the summer. Another hot topic in my logistics committee was school-age child care. I want to just mention that briefly. Uh, we had a lot of discussion at the beginning about how are we going to manage this? If kids, if parents have students in multiple buildings, you know, do we want to have one common school age child care location for the district where everybody goes after school? Do we want to reconfigure somehow? Um, in the end, when we got down into the nitty gritty of it, licensing really wouldn't allow us to make any of those dramatic changes that we talked about, just in terms of the sheer number of kids. Um, and so we will continue to have three school age child care locations next year. At just as we do this year, one at Harding, one at the lower campus, one at the upper campus. Um, our committee talked a lot about potential parent concerns if you have a first grader at the lower campus, fifth grader at the upper campus, how are parents going to manage that? They have to do two drop-offs or two pickups. And, and really what we said is we're going to continue to do what we do right now. We, we are very flexible and work with parents in those kind of situations. If a parent has kids in the two buildings and would prefer to have them both in one place, We'll manage that with busing so that the um, the uh, Roosevelt, the lower campus student can catch a bus or can be put on a bus, I should say, um, up to the upper campus after school so that they're together and can be picked up together. So we'll continue to be flexible as we have been in the past in those situations. We'll work with families for a solution that works with them. Um, and also, we you know we we brought in a new uh, payment and scheduling system this year uh, for our school age child care programs and uh, we've learned a lot through the course of the year and I give I give Dina and her team credit for toughing through those challenges yeah it's been it's been interesting but I, I think we're gonna get those things ironed out into next year so um, that's what we're looking at for school age child care um, most of the things on this slide and I realize the slide may be difficult to see from where you are at um, but I'll kind of talk through it real briefly. And again, in February, we release tentative assignments. In April, we plan on having boxes to those staffs impact by the move um, so they can begin the process of going through their things and packing. Again, we know that's not an easy process. Um, by early May, we should have tentative room assignments out. It could be earlier than that. But by early May, teachers should know where we think they're moving into for next year. Um, we're also going to start at that time and into the summer months organizing some of those common areas, the media centers, the storage areas, the reading libraries, all those kinds of things that we have to kind of get into. Um, and again, I talked through the June process. By the end of June, everything should be moved. Technology come through first. Um, and that's about all I have to say on timeline. Um, in terms of transition activities, I just this is my last my last points that I want to make. Again, our group talked a lot about we need to make sure that we are designing some activities so that students can experience their new buildings and be excited about these transitions coming forward. So none of these activities that I'm talking about are things that our group has planned. They've all been planned either by other committees or by building administrators. But I just want to mention them so that everybody has the information. Uh, we are talking for our fifth, current fifth and sixth graders who are coming to the middle school next year. Um, our administrators have been visiting Coolidge and JFK, trying to have a presence there. Uh, we are organizing a move up day um, at Ferndale Middle School in June, um, where we're actually going to send our seventh and eighth graders home and we're going to get those kids up here and we're going to have a real exciting day for them here where they can meet some of our leaders, walk the building, see what a great place this is. We're going to have the teachers here too so that they can meet the teachers. Um, and again, walk into their summer vacation feel, feeling really good and feeling really excited about coming to Ferndale Middle School next year. And we just switched it to May 25th, apparently. Thank you. Thank you. May 25th, we're doing that. Um, and we're also having a safe night in May for all incoming middle school students. Similarly for elementary, and I won't talk through each of those, pretty much for, e for every grade level, and especially for those students who are moving into a transition, we're, we're providing something like that. We're providing both our administrators are going into the buildings and meeting the kids so the kids know who their principals are going to be. And we also have these move up days scheduled where students can go into the buildings and see them and feel them and experience them and again get excited about being there. So um, my logistics committee, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and again, just like when you move households, we're going to kind of uncover pieces of furniture as we go, and we'll deal with them as we get them. So um, thank you, everybody. If you have any questions, let me know.
And I think um, questions at the end. Okay, very good. And I think, is Mr. Good next? Okay, Mr. Good. I only have one slide, so I don't need to clicker. Um, before I get into my slide, I just want to thank um, everybody that's here tonight, um, not only for being here tonight, but for your engagement in this whole process. I mean, this is really a process that started many years ago with the strategic plan, and then through the entire process last year, um, as, we were, as we were hammering all this out, and then this year with all the committee work that's been done. So really, uh, thank you to everybody in the community, all the teachers that have been so involved, the administrators. Um, we really can't help but be successful when there's this much passion behind uh, this project. So thank you all very much. So um, I have the easy job in all this, and that is communicating everything, all the great work that's been done with the community. And um, so as you'll see on there, just some of the avenues we're going to be doing. Um, the big thing we're going to be doing here soon is a special newsletter that will be distributed within the community. Um, it'll cover everything we talked about tonight, plus any updates that are coming uh, in the future. So um, that'll be distributed home to all the students. Um, it'll also be available for pickup in local businesses. So we're going to start working with local businesses and have them stacks there so people within the community um, at City Hall and stuff can walk around, pick something up, and uh, learn more about all the great stuff going on here in Ferndale. You're going to start to see um, some feature stories in the e-blast. What was really great about tonight was you got a really great once-over of all the stuff that's going on. Um, there wasn't a huge amount of depth, so that's what we're going to start to provide. So um, you really start to see some really deep dives on a lot of the curriculum stuff, especially uh, as Dina talked about tonight. Um, so you start to learn more of the nuts and bolts of all the little things that are going on. Um, we'll also be working with local news media, like our gentleman here from Channel 7, to get the uh, word out within the community. Um, to find out, you know, all the great stuff going on at Ferndale so we can reach outside of our community as well. Um, if you haven't checked out ferndaleforward.com, please do. Uh, that's our transition microsite. Uh, it has all the information that we've talked about so far. Uh, all the stuff from tonight will be up there as well. The meeting is being videotaped. It'll be up on our YouTube channel tomorrow. Uh, it'll be posted on Ferndale Forward as well tomorrow as well as a slideshow from tonight. So um, all the information on the restructuring, if you're looking for any information on the restructuring, Ferndale Forward's kind of your one-stop shop. Um, social media updates, again, will continue. Um, we'll continue to have the monthly superintendent advisory meetings. I think there's two more uh, left this year. So um, again, we have those at 9 a.m. as well as 6 p.m. in the evening on those dates. I don't know the dates off the top of my head, but there's traditionally one a month. Um, and then as well, you'll be seeing some new promotional materials um, that we'll be handing out to resident as well as school choice families discussing the new uh, programs and how they're all going to work to attract new families as well as um, to inform our resident families. So um, again, thank you all very much for coming. And with that, I'll turn it back over to uh, Mr. Pruitt for the question and answer. I believe we do have one more slide. So first off, we all, we all want to say, um, you know, here in Ferndale, we only watch Channel 7. So it's the only channel we ever watch. So just so, so we're clear on that. Only say nice things about Ferndale. <laughs> so overall, our mission, Ferndale School's mission is to provide all students an exceptional education that prepares them for college careers and success in diverse society. All the work that we're presenting tonight is with that goal in mind in our three-legged stool of achievement, sustainability, and equity. Um, so with that, we'll open up floor for any questions and see if we can answer them. So I know Mr. Foreman had one. Yes, sir. Um, I'm going to have Jason explain that. That's with um, the youth assistants, I believe. Uh, yeah, um, it's actually a partner. We partner with the Southeast Oakland Coalition. And uh, basically... Um, it's just a fun night where we open up the gym and the pool here. Uh, we have inflatables in the gym. Um, Southeast Oakland Coalition is a, a, like a healthy living uh, funded through Oakland County where the kids come into the auditorium, they get a 20 minute message on living drug and alcohol free basically, and then they go out and have fun. We have a DJ, inflatables in the gym, open swim, open gym, face painting, video games, that type of thing. It's just a, 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 a safe environment for the, um, for the middle school students. This year, we're, we, we have one in the fall, we, and it's also free. Um, and we have, uh, we're having another one in the spring, and we're inviting the 5th, 6th, and 7th graders to the one in the spring. So 
It's a, it's a fun night. 300 kids, and we're looking for parent volunteers. So if you're able, we will have over 300 kids. So, yes. <laughs> right, yeah. Yes. It, uh, the hours are something like uh, 7 to 9 or 6 to 9 or something along those lines. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yes. No, yeah, so um, the one in the fall we had, we invited the sixth graders, seventh and eighth graders. In the spring, we're going to do five, six, and seven from both Coolidge and JFK. No, we're, yeah, they're on their way out. And <laughs> also, with, with, with bringing the uh, fifth graders in, we, you know, we didn't think it was, a, you know, entirely appropriate to have the eighth graders here, too. So, yeah. All right. Anything else? Safe night? Absolutely, yeah. So um, what we started as well to help with the transition is the, the Web Leader Program. Um, at the middle school, Web stands for Where Everyone Belongs. And our counselor has gone through some training and identified 35 current 7th graders um, as leaders in our building. And they have been trained um, throughout this year in uh, team building and uh, mentoring. And uh, those 35 web leaders are going to uh, kind of adopt uh, 10 incoming sixth graders next year. And uh, we're going to be doing some stuff with them during our move up day uh, in May, as well as on the first day of school, we have this big uh, celebration. And they kind of take them under their wing and kind of show them the Ferndale Middle School way. And then there are ongoing team building and mentoring activities for them to do throughout the school year. So. Um, yeah, so it's, again, to kind of ease, ease with that transition. Any other questions? Yeah, Christy. So um, we we're taking it to your house in July. So we just, yep. <laughs> um, they're in, in the redesign of the locker rooms for the special education space, the uh, very back, it will still be storage where the lockers are. So that will still be, yeah. So that'll still be storage. Um, if we, we have a ton of storage in this building uh, area. So if we need to pull things over, um, we still um, we still have storage spaces available in Coolidge, um, as well as the current storage spaces in, in Roosevelt. We are we have been doing spring cleaning for the last year, um, in all the buildings. So um, we we have a number of things that we know in the buildings because they haven't been cleaned out in a couple decades. Um, so, hmm, the one that you carved into it, yeah. Um, so. Uh, we, we're actually, uh, we actually have a number of dumpsters that are coming at different times. Uh, we've had two auctions of things. We're going to continue to do auctions of old equipment and furniture to try and um, get things out so we know exactly what we want to keep. But we do have storage areas, yep. Any other questions for the good of all? Yes, ma'am. So that's something uh, D. Petrie, who's our director of transportation, has to plot out. Um, and we do have uh, board guidelines in terms of walking distance. Um, so you know the this and they're this they're remaining the same. The walking distances aren't changing. Um, you know, so if they're within that walking distance, then they would walk you know walk to school. Um, so my initial answer would be, you know, if that's the case now, that wouldn't change. Um, 
but every year we have to look at the plots and look and see where everyone is and look and see how many spaces we have on the bus and those different things. Um, people can always request to the transportation department if there if there's a reason um, you know they might need busing that we're unaware of and if per se we were to have space on a bus. Um, but that's something the hard part is when you're looking at transportation you don't always know the students that are incoming so you do your first plot you know this time of year end of the year and then you always have the kindergartens that come in that mess up all your bus routes that you have to redo um, so it's an ongoing process but as as we do it feel free to call the transportation office so they can answer questions and see what's possible hey Karen Mark it down. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're looking at, we're trying to keep to as similar start times as we have now. Um, you know, we, we basically have a two-tiered busing system, um, you know, so in, we're not changing that. Uh, so it's in trying to keep keep with those similar times. There'll be some movement, but probably not a ton with what we're looking at now. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we've worked no, we've um, we've already made the te the um, tentative assignments for teachers back uh, end of January, February. That's there's nothing, you know, hidden about that. That's no, they they can tell whoever they want, except for Sue. Sue's not allowed to tell. <laughs> um, so it, it's it's going to be like every other year, um, because you you never know your official assignment until you get the enrollment. Um, even you know when when I was in the classroom, you'd always get your your tentative assignment. Then all of a sudden you have twenty second graders show up in August, and now I need to move a teacher from first grade to second grade. Or you know, in, in honesty, we're doing that all the way up to the first day of school. So when when uh, parents hear what teacher they have or students get their schedule, it's the same time frame it's always been. But the teachers already have their tentative assignments in the buildings. Um, uh, the instruction office has already been working with uh, the teachers in those groups, um, with the instructional leaders of each each building. Um, so they've already starting to form that building culture and working collaboratively. I mean, I'd first say, you know, when you leave day, talk to Diana just to learn who the teachers are. Um, I know that um, in the PTA meetings in April and May, am I correct in that? Um, we're kind of doing an, an open house at the at the buildings as part of that uh, PTA meeting. Um, so we're working on some things April, May, but in terms of each individual person, um, you know, to talk to the building principal to kind of learn to learn them. The teachers do all get together in, in terms of, you know, before that year starts, they're already getting together to, um, to learn about each other, and, and we always do, you know, move-ups where the principal are going to look at the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, Ta Diana will... Yeah. Yeah.
casa su casa. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, any other questions? Anything for the good of all? Yeah, Mary. So right now, that will really be a leadership team decision. Um, we have um, started talking to the teachers about what they would rather have. You know, would it be best to team teach or would it be best to go back to self-contain? Um, and so we're having that conversation now. Um, I think we're leaning towards one or the other, but I'm meeting with 3-5 tomorrow, and I want them to be on their best behavior. So I'm going to hold that thought in my brain. Right, so what I'm trying to do is just get input from each building's tradition of their camps. Obviously, JFK has had camps much longer than the other two buildings, but everyone has a camp coordinator. All of the buildings have a little different thought about the camp, and the only thing we are doing right now is getting that input from the grade level teachers as to what would be best for our kids for the 16, 17 year, just for next year. Would it be best that kindergarten just goes by themselves? in first grade just go by themselves next year. What's best for second grade? Do we do one day off campus, one day on campus? What's best for third grade? That's all the input that we're getting. Then I will hand it over. I met with Adrian yesterday, um, and Adrian and um, Amy Davison um, at, JF, or at Roosevelt, I want them to get together. We'll hand them that input, and then off and running. Um, and we're also having that conversation with camp. How does that align to the different field trips? So just getting everyone's input into how it's been in the past so that we have a new tradition but honoring our past practices. I should have said that earlier. But Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you all very much for attending. If you have any additional questions, we'll be around. Call, email, text. Send drones anytime you want. Have a great evening.